Thank you, Chad. Um, that was a really moving prayer. Good morning, church. Uh, today we start a new series of four messages based on the values and mission of GCC. Uh, we have entitled the series, Because Jesus Came. So because Jesus came, therefore, we at GCC exist to glorify God by nurturing and equipping people to live gospel-centered lives together in order to transform Kuala Lumpur to love, joy, hope, and rest in Jesus. We are to transform Kuala Lumpur by nurturing and equipping people to live gospel-centered lives together through love, joy, hope, and rest in Jesus. The first value of our mission that we will focus on is love. The passage we chose this morning, John 13, verse 34 to 35, is the foundation that led us to include this value in our mission statement. Let, let me set the scene for us while you turn your Bible to John 13, uh, flip to John 13, and then I'll let, I will set the scene and give you some background before we read the passage. It is at this point, the very end of Jesus' earthly public ministry, it has been a, hasn't been a long one, only three years and a few months, but it is drawing to a close. Jesus, at this point, the very end, it is at this point, at the very end of Jesus, uh, Jesus, sorry, Jesus, this is, uh, it is, Okay, no, okay. Only three years, and but it's now drawing to a close. Jesus knows it, right? He knows that before him is the cross. Now it is the culmination of everything he has came, he has come for. On this evening, he was celebrating the Passover meal in the upper room in Jerusalem with his friends and even an enemy, Judas, there in that upper room. Before the meal, he demonstrated his love for them by getting up, washing his disciples' feet. And after he had finished, he confronted the hatred in a man named Judas Iscariot. And Judas got up and left the room. Jesus knows what that means. Judas leaving the room means that he is going to set in motion everything that follows. His betrayal, his arrest, his set of trials before Pontius Pilate, and eventually his crucifixion. On Jesus' mind, what he's about to say is his last will and testament to his disciples. So if you turn to John chapter 13, let's read the beginning part of John chapter 13 from verse 31, leading into verse 34 and 35. In 31, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, and God, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved for one another. So what is Jesus saying? First, he acknowledges that the Father in heaven had sent him on a rescue mission and that phase one of this rescue mission is almost completed. Soon, he will go to the cross to restore his kingdom. By his atoning sacrifice and resurrection, he will glorify himself and in his humble obedience to the Father's will, he glorifies the Father. Then he will leave and go back home to heaven. The disciples were not keen on Jesus leaving them at all. They were even less keen when he said, I'm going somewhere, you cannot go. 
that means his disciples can't come right now, but he's implying he's going back home, back to heaven, a place reserved for them in the future. And so he gives a final commandment to them in those two last verses of the paragraph we just read. A final set of instruction, and it is these instructions to love that you and I are fulfilling today. So we're going to look at this in a very simple four-point outline. Jesus tells us what to do, why we should do it, how to do it, and then gives us a super answer on how it is possible to do it. Right? Simple four-point outline structure. Here's what to do. Here's why it's important to do it. This is how you do it, and this is how you're able to do it. So let's begin with the first, what we should do. And this is simply stated in one word, to love. Verse 34 that we just read, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Why does he say it's a commandment? Why should love ever be a commandment? Since when does love become a rule that we have to keep? Doesn't love for others just spontaneously rise from the human emotion and flow naturally out of us? No, it doesn't. Anybody who's ever been in a family knows this. Anybody who's ever been married longer than one year or maybe sometimes one month knows this. Anybody who's ever had children knows this. Anybody who's ever lived next to an obnoxious neighbor or colleague knows this. Sometimes it is hard to show love. And we all understand what this means. It is hard to be committed to demonstrate love. We don't always feel like doing it. Warm fuzzy will not follow us all the days of our lives. And why is that? It is because of the fall. Let's go back to the beginning, to the fall of our first parent, Adam and Eve. Ever since the fall, there was a constitutional change in human nature. So right after the fall happened, we became self-oriented creatures. I don't just mean self-aware, I mean self-focused and we became self-centered. Our default mode, the natural human mode, is to be looking at ourselves and predominantly concerned with ourselves. Why do I say that? It's quite easy to prove, right? Who is the first person you look at after taking a group photo? Yourself. I, I confess, I look at myself first. Your first concern is how good you look, how good I look, not how the group photo look on the whole. This commandment to love others is only a commandment because loving others doesn't flow naturally from us. Our sinful nature despises it. Also to call it a commandment is Jesus' way of summing up all the other commandments ever given. Do you remember when Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is that you love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and prophets. So all the thou shalt and all the thou shalt nots can be encapsulated in a single commandment to love. Love then becomes uh, the irreducible minimum whereby all other commandments are fulfilled. You think about it, yeah? If you love God, you won't have other gods before Him. If you love God, you will not take His name in vain. If you love people, you will honor your parents. If you love people, you won't kill them. If you love people, you won't steal from them. If you love people, you won't lie to them. If you love people, you won't covet what they have. It is all summed up in loving God and loving one another. 
That becomes the greatest commandment, but he calls it a new commandment. Now I find that interesting. A new commandment I give you. Some of you are thinking, oh, wait a minute, this isn't really new. I've read this before and I've read it even in the Old Testament. You may be thinking of the passage in Leviticus chapter 19, which says, you will not bear a grudge against your neighbor, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So why does Jesus call it a new commandment? The word he used for new was not the typical Greek word neos. Neos would be the typical word which means new and age and chronology. But instead he uses another word which could be translated as fresh. Here's a fresh commandment. Or let me refresh this commandment. Let me move this commandment to love front and center and make that the kingpin commandment for you. It is a new commandment. It is not new information. It's just new application of old information. Let's take a closer look at this fresh application of this old information. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. How many people were in that upper room with Jesus? You know, there were 12 disciples. One had left, Judas has left. So there's 11 left. So he says to them, love one another. He narrows their love down to just that circle. Why is that an important context? Because it shows us the importance of a tight-knit community of disciples who profess the same faith and who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this passage, it was the disciples in the room. In the present, in our context, it is us, the church, and in a smaller context, Gospel City Church. Let's look at the second point of our outline. Why should we do it? Why should we do it? We look back at verse 34 and 35. I'll read 34, 35 for you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. From this, we can identify two different entities of love, two relationships here. First, the love we show to one another. And secondly, the love that Jesus has shown us. So let's zoom in to both of these displays of love and find the ultimate purpose behind them. Firstly, let's look at how Jesus showed his love for us. I mean, how, have you ever wondered the ultimate mystery of the cross? Why would a holy God die for us such sinners? Was his ultimate reason really just us, for you, for me? Was the cross merely a display of God's love for us? It would be dangerous and totally self-centered on our part to think that we are the ultimate reason Jesus showed his love to us by dying on the cross. That we are the basis, the determinant, the end point of the atonement act of Christ on the cross. Maybe some of you are surprised that I'm saying that. But it's true. You look at verse 31 and 32, which we read earlier. 31 says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. As the inevitable event of the cross loomed over Jesus, he reminds us that the cross was going to achieve what the cross was going to achieve. It didn't just stop at an atonement of sinners, but in the bigger picture, it is for the glorification of God. We see this picture again as Jesus prays for the church in John chapter 17. Please turn to John chapter 17. I will pause a few seconds for you to turn to John chapter 17. 
and we will read verse 1 to 5. Okay, John 17, verse 1 to 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that, you, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your, in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So what we can see here is that Jesus is glorified by his authority over all flesh through his life, death, and resurrection and that the father is glorified through the obedience of the son who accomplished the work that he gave him to do so we can see quite clearly that the end point of the atonement was never us it was actually integral to god's sovereign plan to bring glory to himself so that's why jesus loved us now we move to the second part the love we show to one another answering the question why again jesus says by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another so the key words here is by this all people will know that you are my disciples since simple and clear enough but being known as his disciples also has a higher purpose it is not enough that people just see and identify us as christians if they do not see the god behind our lives it would be just a label that like any other christians muslim buddhist or hindu so a passage that is helpful to illustrate this higher purpose of being a church and being Christians is Ephesians chapter 4. Again, I will pause a few seconds for you to flip to Ephesians chapter 4. We will read the second part of verse 15 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4. So from the second part of 15, it says, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Paul, in his letter to the Ephesus church, reminded the church to grow in love. But to do so, with Christ as the head, from whom the whole body is joined, equipped, and each part working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So even the relationship we have between us in GCC isn't just horizontal love, meaning not just for me and for you. I love you not because of you. You love me, please do not love me just because of me. Our love for one another should submit under a greater truth that we are under the rule of the head, which is Christ. We can see that true love also has a vertical component, which is to lovingly build each other up, ultimately for the glorification of Christ. As you see, in both aspects of love, Jesus' love for us, and our love for one another, they both do not end up with us. Instead, the ultimate purpose for the love we are commanded to do is to glorify God. We have done what? We have explored why. And so in the next section, the third part, we will look at how. 
How should we do it? How should we love one another? Well, you notice Jesus says, you shall love one another as I have loved you. Wow. That's, that's scary, right? He raised his love up to a whole new standard. Now he's qualifying what it means to love one another. The comparative benchmark that we are to use in our love for each other is the kind of love that Jesus has. Love one another as I have loved you. What this means is that I am not at liberty to define this love. I can't set the parameters and the limitation on it. I can't walk away from reading or hearing this command and say, well, I love people who I have warm, positive feelings to. I love the lovable. But this brings us an important question. How do we measure love? This time of the year, December, approaching Christmas, people are going to measure love by words spoken on cards or on WhatsApp messages nowadays, by embraces given, by gifts, flowers, or chocolate. But what did Jesus say? The new standard of love that Jesus was describing is this. I want you to love one another, but I want you to love one another like I love you. So, uh, what's the reference there? Eh? Now, in the same setting, remember the same setting in the room, in the upper room, that same room, same night, in chapter 15 of John, you can turn your Bible to John chapter 15, he records in two important verses, verse 12 and 13, the new standard of love. Turn to John chapter 15. I will read two verses, 12 and 13. Jesus said in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So in verse 12, Jesus repeats the same words he said in our verse for today in chapter 13, verse 34. This is my new my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now listen to what he says right after that in verse 13. Greater love, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So here, Jesus is talking about the cross. He's talking about the ultimate demonstration of God's love for people, the cross. The cross that he's about to undertake. He sets the meaning that what it is to love one another as he has loved, he had loved us. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, who lived a sinless life, dies for undeserving sinners. How can anything be as sacrificial as that? So we now understand that God glorifying love ought to be sacrificial love. What does that mean for us? What's the application? Perhaps it could mean for you and I to take time out of our busy schedule to call our accountability partner and to perform uh, and go through a devotion together, encouraging one another in God's word. Or perhaps it could mean we get out of our comfort zone to serve the church, to greet a newcomer, to be available uh, uh, to, to meet ministry needs. Be sacrificial as Jesus has. Let me just add to that, that Jesus' love is not only sacrificial, but unconditional as well. Jesus is on the cross hours later from the room, and his enemies are shouting at him, persecuting him, calling him names, spitting on him, and they nail him to the cross, he's in pain, I would have said, Father, get them. At any moment, Jesus had the power to call on God to destroy his tormentors. Jesus is innocent. He did not deserve the pain and suffering that he was facing. Instead of calling for the death of those persecuting him, he said, Father, forgive them. Pleading to the Father 
for they did not recognize the God they were offending. That is unconditional love. Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 5 that he loved us when we were still sinners. He didn't love us when we loved him. He didn't love us because we were wonderful and wanted him. When we wanted nothing at all to do with him, he still loved us. And in that same unconditionality of Jesus' love, we are commanded to reflect this in our lives. Do not let the actions of others towards us determine our love for them. Maybe not every Christian we know, not every GCC member is friendly towards you. Or in your mind, someone has not done anything or has not done enough to deserve your love. That doesn't change the fact that you are still members of one body and we are all fixed on the same goal of bringing glory to our King. Jesus didn't impose any condition on us. Neither must we impose any condition to love our brothers or sisters. So, so God glorifying is sacrificial, unconditional, but also never ending. Never ending because God is eternal. Now maybe you are wondering, how can we replicate this love? It seems so hard. But I agree with you. Maybe on this earth, it is impossible to perfectly replicate such God-glorifying love. So, in the final point of our message today, the fourth part of our outline, we will examine how it is possible to do it. So, I'm going to answer the question, how is it difficult, how is it possible, it seems impossible. On our own, with man's sinful nature, you cannot love the way Jesus loves you. You are but you are not stuck in your old sinful self. You are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, you have something that you never had apart from Christ. You have a reservoir of love that never runs out. Yes, you and I, we do have it. When we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So, Walking by the Spirit is the way not to bite and devour each other, but to serve one another through love. The Spirit is the key. We go to a very familiar passage, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Fruits of the Spirit, flip to Galatians 5, 22. I will read it and then we will move from there. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Things no law. The first fruit of the Spirit listed here is love. So it is clear that the crucial link between our being loved by Christ and our loving others is the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus came, love for others is a fruit that grows in our lives by His doing. He makes it happen. It won't happen without Him. And when it does happen, we don't get the glory for it. God does. The Christian life of love is a supernatural life. It is not produced by merely human forces. It requires resources that we do not have. This is very important and necessary for us to admit. It is humbling. Left to ourselves, we cannot. But it is also very encouraging because what it, is, what it means is that if you are sitting there feeling, I am not by nature a loving person, you do not need to feel condemned. Because in fact, nobody is by nature a loving person. If we were, love would not be a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It would be a fruit of our personality, our upbringing, or our genes. 
So the answer to the question, how is it possible? Is that the Holy Spirit makes it possible. The Holy Spirit is a link between Christ's love for us and ours for each other. He works in us in some supernatural way to bear the fruit of love. The love of Christ is not God making much of us, but God saving us from self-centeredness so that we can enjoy making much of Him forever. And our love for others is not our making much of them, but helping them find satisfaction in making much of God. True love aims at satisfying people in the glory of God. What is the application of uh, Jesus' commandment to us as a church, as a body of believers and partners in the gospel? We are called the body of Christ. In one sense, we are called the body of Christ because Jesus physically left his body. We are left here. We become his hands, his feet, his mouth, his embraces. We are the body of Christ. A healthy body that faithfully represents Christ. To this kind of selfless love, that expression of God glorifying love, that to those who have not seen God can see the goodness and the love of God. John Stock writes, we cannot proclaim the gospel of God's love with any degree of integrity if we don't exhibit it in our love for others. So I will restate it in my own words, right? An application of it is love will supercharge our evangelism. We can tell people stuff all day long. It can be so convincing, so amazing that we are so knowledgeable. But God glorifying acts of love supercharge our evangelism. How else are people going to know that you are related to him? How are people going to know you are a Christian? How are they going to know? So here's a thought for us as we end. Why don't you and I start evaluating our lives by love? Not how many people love you, but how many people you love well. Not worried about how many followers you have on Facebook, but be concerned of whether how committed you are being to building up the church. Lip service without life service is empty religion. But lip service combined with life service is impressive and true devotion. The devotion to bring glory to God. Can I close this in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We praise you and glorify you that Jesus was obedient. Because Jesus came, he showed us how to love. Because Jesus came, we are able to love not by our own ability, but by the fruit of the Spirit. Father, we pray that we live our lives able to demonstrate love to each other and pointing those who see us to yourself. Let our love for each other be motivated by the only purpose that matters, to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.